Hi, and welcome to the Meriwether Knitting Podcast. My name is Gabriella, and I'm coming to you from my home in Germany. I'm so excited to chat with you today about all that I've been knitting and making and crafting this week. If you are a returning viewer, welcome back. It's so lovely to see you again. And if you are a new viewer, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. This is the place where I like to talk about all of my fiber art related passions. And I'm excited to have you join me. So I hope you'll get cozy and maybe get something to knit or to crochet or to work on and just chat with me for a little while. Since we last spoke, I've been working on two projects primarily. I don't have any new finished ob objects to show you, but I am wearing one of my finished objects from last episode. And I mean, I love wearing this piece so much. I've been wearing it so often, just kind of throwing it on over just t-shirts like I have right now. I'm just wearing like a very plain kind of white t-shirt and I just love to wear this on top. I think it adds something to the outfit, but it's also just the perfect kind of piece for this time of year. It's been really getting a lot warmer lately, but still, you know, not really warm enough to go out without some kind of overgarment on at least. And so having this piece is just the perfect piece for that kind of in-between weather. And it really keeps me super warm. This vest is knit out of um, Jacob's wool. So it's the yarn is um, West Yorkshire Spinners, West Yorkshire Spinners, Jacob's Aaron yarn. And it's, so it's a nice, thick, fluffy, wonderful, rustic yarn that just keeps me nice and warm. I've loved it so much. And this is the vest number two pattern by My Favorite Things, which I have talked about at length in other episodes, but I really, really enjoyed wearing it. It's just been a very practical piece for me. And I also like, I wear it over like, I have like a shirt dress that I like to wear it over. And it's just super, a super wearable piece, which surprised me because I've mentioned this also before, but I, I was never really a vest person. I never had a vest, I never wore vests. I never like wanted to wear vests, but I feel like vests have made a comeback or are making a comeback right now. I'm really jumping on that bad bandwagon. I actually kind of have like, ideas for another vest I want to knit and maybe even like a design because I really I just like the like kind of canvas of a vest it's just a nice cool canvas knitting wise and of course it's also fun to have a project that you have a completed garment without having to knit sleeves I'm not the biggest sleeve hater I don't mind knitting sleeves but you know just having the body finished and then basically being done with a sweater kind of is really a fun thing. So yeah, that's my little, that's number two that I'm wearing. I really have been wearing this a lot lately. And I also think this brown color, the colorway is called brown black. It's, it's a very like dark, beautiful brown. It matches a lot of neutrals. I even think it kind of goes with black and kind of beiges or whites, obviously. I feel like the white is like shining in this lighting, but um, I really, really love this piece and I'm really, really happy to have it. So on to my works in progress. I am excited to share with you. Also link below in the description box will be all the materials that I talk about in this video and all of the patterns. And there are also timestamps below. So if you're looking for something specific or you wanna skip over some part of the video, you can do that by um, looking below and clicking on one of the timestamps. But the first thing I'm gonna show you today are my sock project. The socks that I feel like I've been sharing with you for a long time but it took me a while to finish that first sock. Now I've started the first, the second sock. I, I think last week, I don't know if I even had anything to show you. I don't think I had made any progress on the second sock at all. But this week, I don't think I even, if I had started, I may have just started the cuff or just cast on. I can't remember exactly, but this week I knit the whole entire cuff, whole entire leg of the sock. And I'm super happy with it. Oh, look at this beautiful, delicious pattern. It's just such a decadent, beautiful, beautiful sock. Um, this is the Cornish Cream Tea Sock Pattern by Helen Taylor of Curious Handmade. And it's such a blissful knit. Every single row she has written out for you, the instructions for every single row um, in this pattern. So if you're a new sock knitter or you've never knit pattern socks before, and or you just like to read written lace and cable patterns, this would be the perfect project for you, the perfect pattern for you. I am just using the chart to knit this pattern. They, she also just has the chart there as well. Um, if you're more into knitting just from charts or you are very experienced with sock knitting or with lace knitting, then it's very also nice just to have that chart. So I'm just knitting it from the chart, but it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful pattern. 
super ladylike and feminine. And I'm knitting this out of Regia yarn, the Regia Premium Cashmere yarn in the colorway Pink Parfait. And when I started these socks, when I cast them on, I really wanted to knit some cashmere socks. I wanted something cashmere because I have two pairs of cashmere socks that I knit myself a few years ago. I think when I first started knitting socks, I just wanted to knit some kind of cashmere socks. And they were both beautiful hand-dyed skeins of yarn that were just so stunning and luxurious to work with. And at that time, I mean, I don't even know the combination. I think it's like a merino nylon cashmere combination. They're both from Volan Vine Yarns. I don't know if it's a base she still uses or not, but um, it's a beautiful, beautiful yarn and beautiful socks. And in the winter, I love to sleep with socks on. And when I put these socks on and get into bed, I just feel like a princess in them because the cashmere and the merino, I mean, the cashmere just gives it that little extra bit of luxury. And I feel like for me in life, just that kind of like a touch of luxury, like a little tiny bit of cashmere makes me feel just like so good. It really elevates my life experience. And I even think, you know, even just wool alone um, does that for me too. Like wearing this vest for me is like luxurious. I feel like, you know, any wool, any, I feel like natural fibers give that feeling for me, this kind of like, I don't know how to explain it. It just makes me feel connected in a different way. I guess I have a different feeling from wool than I do from like cashmere or silk. Cashmere or silk really give me this princessy feeling. And so I wanted that again from a, pair, from a pair of socks because I had knit a couple of pairs just in very basic workhorse, um, commercial, yeah, wool, nylon sock blends. And there's nothing wrong with that. I love those sock yarns. Probably my next pair of socks is going to be out of those yarns. But I just wanted something more decadent. And so, yeah, this has given me that. Even just the knitting process, it's definitely less cashmere content than those beautiful hand-dyed skeins that I had knit my yarn, my socks from a few years ago. But I think these are going to be a little bit more sturdy and a little bit more, more robust. And this yarn is definitely a little bit more luxurious and decadent than a plain regia yarn, for example, just a regia, regia sock yarn, which I do love regia sock yarn. So I knit often using that yarn. But these are going to be gifted to someone very special to me who really deserves to feel like a queen and like when she puts on socks. So I hope these give her that feeling. And I think that that yarn combination with this beautiful cable lace pattern and just this colorway, everything about it, this femininity, this ladyness is just a beautiful, luxurious pair of socks. So I'm so loving these, these socks. I love knitting on them. I definitely want to knit another pair of kind of patterned socks soon with, you know, not just vanilla socks. I love to like add something in there for my next well, in the future, a future pair of socks in the not too distant future. Anyway, I've been using my DPNs as like a pointing tool in this part of the video. So I hope you've enjoyed that little kind of, they're very useful to like demonstrate what I mean. You can see also, I made a couple of little mistakes in the um, little cable parts, but they're socks, you can't tell. And it does not compromise the wearability of them at all. I don't even think they're very noticeable unless you're really, really looking, like who's looking that close? So I'm very happy with it. I'm just enjoying these, this knit. It's so much fun. It's such a joy. And it's really just gives me that little like extra bit of, it also feels like a, a springy knit for me because of the colorway, because of that kind of little tiny bit of little lacy, laciness that feels like a little bit of a springy, has a springy feel to it, which I really have enjoyed because here in Germany, it's taken a while to get warm, although, Last week, it was so nice and warm on Sunday, which was Mother's Day. Um, I'll show that with you a little bit later in the video. But yeah, that's my first little work in progress that I have to share with you. And the next one is my Tudor Rose project, my Elizabeth I. If you are new here, I am hosting a knit along for the Tudor Roses book by Alice Starmore. We are knitting patterns from this book, the Tudor Roses by Alice Starmore for the whole entire year of 2021. And I'm hosting this knit along along with two other podcasters, Bella of 100 Acre Wool and Sophie of the Bianca Creations podcast. And we are just knitting different patterns from this book. We are going to be doing giveaways along the way. And actually the first giveaway is hosted by me, my little cast on giveaway. And um, yeah, if you're knitting a book from a pattern from this book, you can enter 
to win the prize from that giveaway by posting in the hashtag, hashtag TudorRoseCal, or, and, or, you can do both, um, by posting in my Ravelry group under the Tudor Roses chatter thread. So we've just been chatting in there. So fun to hear and see projects, you know, get inspiration. It's really inspiring to see when other people are starting, when they're working, we're just all doing together. So it's really been fun. And if you'd like to enter, just post in those places, either one of them or both of them, and you can win a prize. And feel free to join the Cal. You can also join it later on in the year. It goes the whole entire year. So it's just an open, open it along. But I've really, really, really been enjoying my Elizabeth the First. I'm holding it in this beautiful, beautiful project bag by Noble Character Crafts. Oh, it's so, so beautiful. And it's just been the best companion. Oh no, there's a little fluff on it. So don't mind the beautiful, the cat fluff in my bag, but it's the most stunning, amazing bag. Perfect size for my sweater project. I am almost finished with the first ball of yarn. I have my second one right here at the ready in the bag. And there's lots of space still, so I know that the sweater's definitely gonna fit in here along the way. But yeah, I have about this much left of the first ball. So I'm getting close to the end. Since we last spoke, I've made good progress on this body, on this piece or this side of the sweater. As you can see, I've knit up over the cuff. I think I was about here last time. I actually put a stitch marker, I think where I was um, last time we spoke, which I think was about here. My little progress keeper stitch markers are all from Mitgan who is also a podcaster here on YouTube. She's a German podcaster. And these are beautiful, beautiful stitch markers by her. They're little stones, lapis lazuli stones. And I think that they just match so well with this yarn, which this yarn was very graciously sent to me by Virtual Yarns, which is the Starmore Yarn Company. And honestly, knitting this pattern using this yarn has been such an amazing experience. You really feel that this pattern is designed with and for this yarn because it just fits so well together. I love the fabric that this is creating. I really love the fabric. I love the density of it. It's not really dense, the kind of like the closeness of it, the tightness of it. It definitely feels like a piece that's going to wear extremely well. And I just like the structure that it has. I feel like lately, recently I've been knitting more, or often I think a lot of patterns using finger weight yarn tend to have a little bit of a looser gauge for garments, which is also, you know, nice in its own way. But having this bit more sturdy, robust, yeah, I guess a little bit denser fabric is really, really nice and really lovely. And this colorway I chose is the Macare colorway. It's super beautiful. It's a kind of a green, neutral green, which is worsted spun with lots of other gorgeous, beautiful colors. You can see there are blues in there, reds, um, warm tones, a couple of little cool tones. It's just absolutely beautiful. It's it's really a very multi-dimensional, gorgeous yarn, which I'm just enjoying knitting with so, so much. And the pattern is such a breeze. Honestly, this is such an easy knit in the best way. It definitely takes engagement as far as like, you know, you're not knitting in the round, so you do have to purl, but I'm, I really like to purl. And I love to purl. I don't know. I just have nothing against it at all. I really enjoy it. As you can see, I've begun this center V. Uh, the pattern has a deep V cabled pattern in the front and back. I'll put a photo here of the pattern as well so you can see how it looks completed. But I've just started that here. I've made some good progress on it already and I really love it. It just adds a little bit of interest to the pattern. But this pattern is definitely doable for a knitter who maybe you don't have a ton of experience or you are kind of new, a new knitter, or maybe you just, don't want something that takes a ton of mental brain power, but you still want to knit kind of a very elegant, very structured, beautiful, timeless garment. If you could knit this, you know, I really think this is for every skill level, it would be perfect. I have loved working on the pattern because it's just so, it's also just perfectly written. So I, I'm really, really enjoying it. I recommend this to anyone. If you want to jump into the Tudor Roses book, but you're a little intimidated because the designs look so elaborate and so just, yeah, kind of like next level. This would be a perfect starting project for you because it really is an easy knit. Alice Starmore even says in her descriptions of the pattern that this is an easy knit and it really truly is. So I've been enjoying it a lot and highly recommend this knit. I'm so excited about seeing it on and completing it and wearing it. I'm already just, I want to have it on. I can't wait. I can't wait for the autumn because I think by then, Hopefully I'll have it finished and I can just get a lot of good wear out of it. 
it's a very dramatically shaped pattern. So it is very like, it has just some dramatic shaping in it. I have seen that some people have omitted shaping or not done all of the shaping to accommodate, you know, what kind of fit they want to have. And that's a really cool option too, if you don't want the extreme shaping. On um, the Tudor Rose chat on my Ravelry group, and I'm sure also in the other two podcasters Ravelry groups, you can talk about that and also probably get, get good tips on that. Also, of course, on Ravelry, people have on the project pages often notes, which is super helpful. But I've included all of the shaping that the pattern calls for, and I really love the dramatic shaping. I'm so, I don't think I've ever knit a piece with this kind of like structure and shape. I keep doing this, but that is what I see. It's like this hourglass shape that is worked into this pattern. So it's really, really beautiful. There it is. I'll try to show it to you. I feel like I've been showing it to you a little half-heartedly, not very intentionally, but there it is. The bottom is kind of rolling up a bit, which of course will get better with seaming and blocking. Oh, there it is. Oh my gosh, I love this piece. I just love seeing it. I love how it looks. I think it's so beautiful. And it's just such a fun piece. It's also been an amazing opportunity for me to get back into learning about the Tudor women and learning about Elizabeth I, whose life was just absolutely extraordinary. So I've really enjoyed that. I love this historically inspired pattern. I love this whole concept and it just, it really makes the whole knitting process really rich for me. The fact that it's based on the life of a real person who I also really admire and think is super interesting. With this book, this is the first, I think I mentioned this before, but this is the first knitting book I'm ever working from. I've never knit from a book before. I often print out patterns or work from digital patterns. And often, you know, if it's a more complex pattern that has charts or has detailed instruction that I will print it out and have the printed version. But often, you know, if it's a very simple pattern, I'll just keep the digital version and reference it right now and then when I need, you know, to know something, a little detail. But when I print out patterns, I mark them up like crazy. I don't know how it is for you. I would love to hear how you work from printed out patterns or even books. If you're somebody who leaves them or who makes, you know, notes somewhere else in a notebook or on a piece of paper or digitally, but I, on those pieces of, on those patterns that I print out, I like mark them. I like cross things out, cross out other sizes, circle my size, do all my notes, I do all kinds of like marking to this paper until it's basically like, you can hardly see the pattern anymore. I really, really like mark up my patterns when I print them out. And I always think, yeah, it's printed out. I can always print it out again if it gets legible for me, but that's never happened. With this book, this is such a special book and I want to keep it in good condition, but I can imagine at a different point in my life, maybe I will want to return to this book and knit the Elizabeth the first again, because it's such a special pattern. And like I said, a really doable pattern that I can see myself knitting it twice, honestly. So I don't want to mark up the book in a way, I don't really want to mark it up at all, honestly, but at the same time, I was noticing as I was, knitting from the chart that I wanted to mark which which row I was on so that when I came back I would know and of course I could keep like a post-it note or keep a note in there and write it on the note but I don't know I'm not I'm really like somebody who dog ears pages and books I'm not I, I use my books and my things pretty intensely and I also like love bookmarks and I'm careful and all that but I just use things pretty heavily, but with this book, I really wanted to be very careful about not marking it up in a permanent way because I wanted to return to it. And then I'm going to have to knit this twice, you know, both for each side. So even coming back the second time, I, don't, I didn't want to confuse myself at all. So what I did was I, I mean, pencil is an obvious option, but I had a pencil and I started with the pencil and then I lost my pencil and I just had one pencil in this house. Does anyone else not have any pencils anymore? Like I don't have any pencils and I, I was a little bit sad about that. I have charcoal pencils because my husband has, my husband is like an artist and he has lots of things like that, but that I can't use charcoal pencils for this. But I found erasable pens and this has been like revolutionary for me while knitting from this book because I have a pink erasable pen and I feel like I've told you the longest story now just to tell you this one thing, but I have a pink erasable pen, which I had forgotten about, which I discovered and which has now been my most favorite, absolutely favorite fun accessory to my life ever. I have been using it to mark 
every time I'm on a new row and to like write a little note for myself. And then when I come back, I erase that note and then I keep knitting and then I write another one. And because this paper is like so beautiful, the quality is just like super high. It's like these beautiful glossy sheets. It doesn't even, the paper doesn't even feel the pen at all. It's like erased as if it had never been on there. It doesn't like erase any part of the paper, it doesn't damage the paper. I'm just absolutely amazed by this. And it's always in pink. Honestly, I don't know. I feel like this is giving me too much joy. It's too much fun for me. Maybe this is, seems like crazy, but honestly, it's just been like the highlight of my life to have, be able to like write my notes on this book with a pink pen and then erase it the next day. So yeah, that's my, that's what I'm doing when learning from this book. I'd love to hear if you mark up your patterns or if you're somebody who's very like careful about that kind of thing, you doesn't do that. If you have like a notebook you use or how you do that, because I also have like a knitting notebook that I keep kind of my cue in. I write down ideas for different patterns. I sometimes even write like pattern notes when I'm knitting from a project, but mostly I just mark up the pattern itself. And that works for me. But this time I love my new solution. So that has been so much fun. That is all that I have to tell you about my Elizabeth the First. I am knitting the, this in a little bit of a smaller needle size. I'm knitting this in a US two on a US two needles, which is, yeah, 2.75 millimeter needle. Um, I think that might be a little bit smaller than the pattern calls for, but not very much, I think. So that's what I've been, I've been doing those two projects. That's all I have to share with you project wise. I would love to hear what you're working on, what you've been up to the last couple of weeks. And I have one more knitting related thing to share with you before we talk about kind of personal updates. And that is this little penguin pa knitting pattern book. It's actually not just patterns, it's a knitting book. It's called the Penguin Knitting Book. I don't know if I've shared this with you before on the podcast, but I got this a few months ago. Nick, my husband, gifted this to me. And I've really, really enjoyed flipping through this in the past week or two. It's by James Norbury, and it's including six patterns for over 60, you know, including patterns for over 60 garments, the Peg Penguin Knitting Book. And um, it was first published in 1957 and packed with wonderfully nostalgic designs. This is the classic guide to British knitting, it says. So on the back, it also says, I know of no home craft that enjoys the universal popularity of knitting. So it's a very cute, classic book. And it was a really, really good gift because I've learned so much from this book just by kind of flipping through it, reading it, reading like, about different techniques, casting on, casting off, um, you know, just all kinds of different things. It's really like a little reference book, which is wonderful. And there are also super cool, sweet vintage patterns here too, which are just so cute and so much fun. And I'd love to knit from one at some point in the future. I've never knit from a vintage pattern before, but I love seeing um, when people knit from vintage patterns and the results that they get and the kind of like outcomes, I think you have to learn a couple of different, sometimes different terminology and um, there may be a tiny little bit of a learning curve, but I'm excited about that. I think it's super cool. And just as a reference book, I've really enjoyed flipping through this. One thing that I thought about while reading this, or I wanted to learn about when I opened this book this week, were moths and how they handled moths. Because I thought, you know, that is not just a modern problem, obviously. Um, having moths and moths putting your knitwear in danger and your knitted garments and your knitted, your just wool and yarn in danger has been, yeah, a thing which has been around for a while. So I looked in there and, and got a couple of good tips, but as it gets warmer, I've just been thinking, we've had the windows open all the time and I'm really nervous about moths coming and eating all of my knits and all of my wool because I have one time had a moth attack and the moths, they ate through one of Nick's sweaters that I had knit him, like a colorwork sweater. And I didn't even, I haven't even repaired it in any way. He still wears it, but it has like different holes in it. Little tiny holes that are little moth holes. They ate through a shawl and that I had knit. And I don't know, it was just very disheartening when that happened. I'd love to hear what you do. I keep most of my stash in a huge plastic tub, which is closed. And I feel that that's pretty safe, but you know, my works in progress, or even I have like a basket of knitting of, of yarn and works in progress kind of things. 
in my bedroom and one in the living room. And I'm a little bit nervous about having just baskets of knitwear. If there's something I should do to prevent those, if I should just lock all that yarn away, if I can put something in there that prevents the moths. I know I've heard mothballs can be kind of toxic. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know if I'm being, you know, over careful. Um, but I would love to hear what you do to prevent moths. If there's any kind of trick or tip that you have, please share it with me because I feel like I just don't want to risk, I don't want to risk the knits. It's really sad to think about losing anything or having holes in projects that I've spent time on or even works in progress. Like I have this you know, my clover pullover, which I've been working on, I only have like half of one side, but it's taken so long to knit because it's a elaborate, complex cable design. And to think about moths getting after that piece just breaks my heart and makes me super scared. So I need to put it away somewhere. But anyway, that is all I have to share with you knitting wise. I'll have to talk to you about with you knitting wise this week. Um, it's been so lovely to have you. This last week, we had a wonderful week. We had a Mother's Day on Sunday and the weather was just divine. I think it was like 25 degrees Celsius, it was super warm. We just went out and had a picnic. First, we went to visit my mother-in-law and had a little coffee at her home with my father-in-law and Nick and just celebrated her. And then um, Nick took me on a picnic with our daughter Esmeralda. We had an amazing time, it was so much fun. My favorite thing in the world is truly to like, just put a blanket in the grass in the sunshine on a spring day and just lay there and knit or read just to be together. It's so much fun to just be in the sunshine like that and just have this like leisurely time. I feel like there's nothing for me that feels more restful than that, truly. Just reading or knitting in the sun. I love it, it's my favorite thing. I'd love to hear what you did for Mother's Day if you did something special, I feel like, it's a little bit strange because Thursday after Mother's Day was Father's Day here in Germany, which I didn't even know was going to happen. And it was so adorable because Nick made such a big deal about Mother's Day and, you know, got me flowers and all kinds of things. And then on Wednesday, I realized that the next day was going to be Father's Day. I was absolutely like shocked and kind of terrified and traumatized by this because I had prepared absolutely nothing. I think in the States, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think in the States, Father's Day is in June. So I had kind of had that in my mind, but I, I was just really, really sad because you know, for, for Nick and I, it's like we have one child, she's a baby. So it's, a, but it's very much like this kind of like extra day to celebrate each other kind of feeling, which we really enjoy doing. We like to like celebrate every chance we get. I remember when I first started dating him and it was going to be our first kind of Valentine's Day together. Before Valentine's Day, he said to me like, Valentine's Day, that's just an invention of the floral industry. Who even, who even cares about that? Like, you should just share your love with each other every day. And I was like, what do you mean? Of course we're gonna celebrate each other every day, but even like, why not take it up a notch on Valentine's Day? Let's celebrate Valentine's Day like even more. And plus, I was a florist at that time, and I was like, how dare you? The floral industry, like, the floral industry is important. You should support it anyway. <laughs> I don't know. I was just, I, it is very busy for florists. That is true, and also very stressful. And at the flower shop I worked at, actually, like, if people called the day before Valentine's Day, we had to turn away customers because we were so full. And Mother's Day was actually even worse than that, though. Mother's Day was, is, was the busiest holiday at the floral shops that I worked at. So, of course, it's probably dependent on your location. I was like, no, Nick, Valentine's Day is very important. And I think he wasn't trying to make an excuse, but I think there was just, there's this attitude, which I see in a lot of people to like kind of say, you know, Valentine's Day is important or it doesn't count. And I, and I think like, it's not that it needs to be a consumeristic holiday. I don't think that that's important. I think that the consumerism is not important at all, but I'm just a romantic. And every chance that I get to make a day a holiday and to celebrate, I will take it. And for me, that means, you know, being together, kind of just spending time together, talking. In those first couple of years that Nick and I were together, I was just like, no, on that day, I just, I don't expect much, but I'm going to write you a poem. <laughs> I'm going to give you like a meal. And then he was like, oh my gosh, okay. And then we would just like cook meals together. He would make me dinner. I would like 
you know, do something for him. And we just like share our love in those kind of ways, which, you know, I think we're not very consumeristic ways anyway, but Father's Day was then like, was like I had to hustle to get something together for him. And so it wasn't much because he's a freelancer. He works freelance, which means that he often works from different contracts, little mini contracts, different projects. And it's often like inconsistent knowing when exactly the next contract's gonna come. So he's had a couple of things in recent weeks and months that he's had to work on and he has deadlines that are tight. So actually on Father's Day anyway, he had to work the whole day, but I made sure that he came home to something nice and we made him cards. Esmeralda even like drew for him a picture of scribbles, but I'm gonna celebrate him a second time on the American Father's Day so that he feels very, very celebrated because I felt so celebrated on Mother's Day, which was so lovely. But anyway, I hope you have a wonderful week. It's been so lovely to spend this time with you. I feel like I've been a little jumbled in this episode, but I hope that you've enjoyed sitting with me. And if you have, please subscribe, join, leave a like if you did like this video. You can find me, like I said, on Instagram under Meriwether Knitting on Ravelry and the Meriwether Knitting Group. And also my Ravelry, Ravelry username is Gabriella K. You can also friend me there. You can always get in touch with me via DM or in the comments below or on Ravelry Messenger, wherever it suits you. I'd love to hear from you and to chat with you and to connect. It's just so wonderful to have this community. So I hope you have a wonderful week and I look forward to seeing you again next week for another episode. Bye.